Are there any senators wishing to vote or change their vote? If not on this vote, the yeas are 49, the nays are 37. Three-fifths of the senators duly chosen and sworn, not having voted in the affirmative, the motion is not agreed to. I enter a Majority Leader. I enter a motion to reconsider the vote by which cloture was not invoked. Motion is entered. Senator from Texas, there will be order. Mr. President, I come to the floor today to discuss and pass the risk-based security screening for members of the Armed Forces Act. How many times have you been at an airport screening line, you're getting ready to go through the machines that are going to uh, determine that you're safe to travel, and standing right there in the line is a man or woman in their military fighting gear, their camouflage and their combat boots, and they're having to take off their combat boots uh, many times in, in their two-week R&R period between their stints in Afghanistan or Iraq. And you think, oh my gosh, I mean, that is just un unbelievable that our military people who are putting their lives on the line, who are sacrificing so much, are having to go through a procedure uh, that just doesn't have a common sense feel about it. So last week, Senator Rockefeller, Senator Burr, and I introduced Senate Bill 1954, the risk-based security screening for members of the Armed Forces Act. The bill was a modification of the House Companion Bill that was recently passed by Representative Cravat from Minnesota in a unanimous decision uh, by the House. And it requires the, the TSA, the Transportation Security Agency, to create a system to speed members of our uniformed services through airport security. I would also like to thank Senators Lieberman and Collins for their input on this piece of legislation. We've all worked hard to move this bill through quickly, and it is the House bill that we will be taking up very shortly with the modifications that I have mentioned. The bill establishes a timeline for the Transportation Security Administration and the Department of Defense together to develop and implement a program to establish expedited security screening procedures for military personnel and their families. I think we can all agree that our military men and women make sacrifices for our nation every day. The least we can do is try to make their lives a little easier when they travel around the country they defend. I think they have earned the right to at least go to the head of the line uh, or have some kind of trusted passenger status. Our armed forces are comprised of over 1.4 million brave men and women. They're stationed at more than 6,000 military bases worldwide. For all the hardships they endure, I think they deserve to be at the front of the line in some kind of procedure that expedites their security clearance. Airports, airlines, and TSAs recognize this issue and they want to reduce the delays. Currently, TSA uses the same screening protocols for all passengers. But TSA has indicated that it would like to improve the process and move forward to risk-based screening procedures. They certainly have my support, and I know many members, if not the overwhelming majority in Congress, to do that. Uh, Mr. Pistol, the head of the Transportation Security Administration, uh, has testified before our Commerce Committee about the risk-based screening procedures that they are trying to put in place that will give them a better opportunity to target people that are more at risk or more under suspicion while letting frequent flyers and people in the military uh, go through on an expedited basis. I would say the first identifiable group to get risk-based screening processes should be those who are fighting this war, those with boots on the ground. Members of our military and their families traveling on orders and in uniform should benefit from these new rules. 
In a time of limited resources, the establishment of procedures to expedite the screening of a pool of travelers who are most certainly our trusted travelers would better allow the TSA to focus their attention on areas of real threat. Earlier this year, the House passed uh, Congressman Cravat's bill unanimously just a couple of weeks ago. And I hope that our quick and unanimous action will allow the House to quickly reconsider the modified measure and get the bill signed into law as soon as possible. As we are going into this traveling season, we've been through Thanksgiving and we're now approaching Christmas, uh, the bill is not going to be implemented by this season. They can't do it in two weeks. But surely by the next holiday season, our trusted travelers, the members of our military and their families will be able to have this expedited procedure. And I hope that as they are traveling in this year's uh, rush through uh, the processes to get home to their loved ones, that they will know that we are working on something that will make their lives easier and expedite their travel while they are home on leave fighting the war that is protecting our freedom and our way of life. So, Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent. We're not. Okay. Under the previous order, the President will be immediately notified of the Senate Action Executive Session. Uh, Mr. President, the Senate will resume I would ask. And the Senate will resume legislative session. Did we move into legislative session? Yes, we did. Thank you. Uh, I ask unanimous consent that the Committee on Commerce be discharged from further consideration of H.R. 1801 and the Senate proceed to its immediate consideration. Clerk will report. H.R. 1801, an act to amend United States Code to provide for expedited security screenings for members of the armed forces. Is there objection to proceeding to the major? Without objection, the Senate will proceed. I ask unanimous consent that the amendment at the desk be agreed to, and I urge passage of the bill as amended. Without objection, the amendment is agreed to. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Mr. President, Nation. I ask consent that the motion... The bill as amended, as amended is passed. Thank you. I ask consent that the motion to reconsider be laid upon the table and any statements relating to the measure appear at the appropriate place in the record as if read. No objection. Mr. President, I thank you and I'm very pleased that we have been able to expedite this bill for the expedited travel procedures uh, for our military personnel. Uh, the TSA will have about 180 days working with the Department of Defense to get procedures in place to do this. And I just hope that our military people, wherever they are in the world, know how much America appreciates their service. And we know they are fighting for our way of life to prevail for our children and future generations. Thank you, Mr. President. And I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Ohio. Thanks, President. I echo the words of the senior senator from Texas in support of our men and women who might be home and leave, might have been sent somewhere on active duty, and that, they are, that, 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 that I echo her words, that's the least we can do. So I thank the gentlelady from Texas. Uh, Mr. President, I ask you now, consent the Senate proceed to a period of morning business until 7.30 p.m. with senators permitted to speak there on, for up to 10 minutes each. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Ten years ago this month, Ten years ago, actually tomorrow, I believe, this, China, this the China, People's Republic of China officially joined the World Trade Organization. American businesses, we were told, would gain new access to Chinese markets through the removal of trade barriers, through increased transparency, through more stringent protection of intellectual property rights. China promised to follow the rule of law to reform its legal system and in turn would gain new access to global markets. At the time it joined the World Trade Organization, China made a number of promises. Chinese leaders pledged to reduce trade barriers and open up markets. They promised to increase transparency, 
protect intellectual property rights, and reform their legal system. Supporters of the People's Republic of China, including a strong majority, unfortunately, of members of this body, and a much thinner majority in the House of Representatives. Other supporters of the People's Republic of China were uh, most of America's, almost all of America's largest corporate CEOs. I uh, argue that the, the WTO membership would bring human rights and freedom and the rule of law to China. Ten years later, we see a very different picture, a picture that a number of members of the House in those days uh, and some members of the Senate and some opponents to allowing China into the World Trade Organization, they have, we have seen something very different. American workers have seen millions of jobs shipped to China. Factories in places like Youngstown and Charleston and Huntington and Dayton have moved to Wuhan and Shenzhen and Xi'an and Shanghai with final products sold back to the United States. Think about this, Mr. President. The business plan of a number of American corporations is to shut down production in Mansfield, Ohio, and in Zanesville, Ohio, and move that production to Beijing or Xi'an, China, set up companies there, and ship products back to the United States. To my knowledge, never in history have, has there been a country where such a huge number of companies would set up that business plan. I mean, think about that. Shut down production in the country where you're located. Shut down production, laying off workers who have made you a successful company. Shut down, hurt a community by, by closing down that plant, doing terrible damage to the schools, to the police departments, to the city services and all that and move your production to another country because you can work there more cheaply and sell products back to the United States. To my knowledge, never in world, I could be mistaken about this, but nobody's ever shown me otherwise. To my knowledge, never in world history has that been the business plan for so many companies. American manufacturers that stay here have been undermined by a flood of cheap Chinese imports priced artificially low. When a large corporation moves to China, so often that corporation's supply chains, a tool and die shop, a tool and die maker, a machine shop, a small manufacturer that makes components that sells to the larger company, they don't have the wherewithal to follow them to China, so they lose one of their biggest customers. So those American manufacturers that stay here have been then undermined by a flood of cheap Chinese imports priced artificially low. Some of those Chinese imports came from American companies that moved overseas to China. Chinese citizens so often face poor work conditions, continual human rights violations. The country's sole Nobel Peace Prize winner, China's sole Nobel Peace Prize winner is languishing in prison. The big winner, the big winner is the multinational corporations here that have outsourced jobs. And the other big winner is the Chinese gov communist government and the apparatchiks that they have enriched. Think about that. The big winner is, uh, the big winners in this China trade policy are large American corporations who have outsourced jobs to China and the Chinese Communist Party, which apparently seem to be their allies in this, and the people in the Chinese Communist Party, the high-ranking apparatchiks that, uh, that benefit from this. So while American companies that stay here and American workers are following World Trade Organization rules intended to promote a, provide a common set of law to ensure a level playing field for global trade, the Chinese are gaming the system. It's clear that China doesn't live up to its promises, doesn't live up to the unrealistic expectations of its supporters. Far from becoming freer, the Chinese people are burdened with limited rights to basic freedoms of speech and religion and assembly. I can't count the number of CEOs that I saw walk the halls, I was in the House of Representatives then, Mr. President, that I saw walk the halls of Congress and say, you know, if we pass PNTR, we're going to see freedom, it's going to, all this capitalism in China, all these jobs in China are going to bring freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly in China. No, it's, it's made, it's, it's, it's enriched the country of China, to be sure. It's especially, though, enriched the Communist Party, enriched the People's Liberation Army, enriched some of the capitalists in China in this Communist Party system. And it's getting worse. From the harsh crackdown on human rights lawyers and activists after the Arab Spring in the Middle East, to the brutal policies in Tibet, 
that have led to a recent wave of self-immolations. Imagine the depth of feeling and passion and hopelessness and anger at, a gover at an oppressive government that people who have such strong feelings would actually set themselves on fire in protest. From the crackdown on human rights lawyers to the brutal policies in Tibet, Chinese Communist, the Chinese Communist Party shows no sign of easing its grip on the Chinese people. Not only did their membership, their joining the WTO, not bring freedom and democracy to China, didn't bring fair trade either. China's flouted WTO rules, China's gamed the system to its advantage. While China's chosen to comply with some WTO rules, overall the list of China's WTO violations is a long one. Rampant intellectual property theft, massive subsidies for China's exports, hoarding of rare earths and other raw materials. China's refused to commit to the WTO's agreement on government procurement. I've stood here, as you've seen, Mr. President, in your time in the Senate, I've stood here arguing for made in America language so that when taxpayer dollars are spent buying products, that those products should be made in America, paid for by U.S. taxpayers. I've heard conservative Washington politicians defending, defending China for all intents and purposes, saying no, that would create a trade war, even though China won't sign on to an agreement on government procurement, which is exactly what their Made in China policy is all about. These violations not only show China's lack of respect for the rule of law, they also cost American jobs, they also help they also tend to stymie our economic growth. American uh, intellectual property intensive firms alone have lost some $50 billion to IP property, to intellectual property right violations. With those same firms reporting that better enforcement, better intellectual property enforcement could lead to almost 1 million new jobs. Some of the worst hit are companies in my state struggling to compete against a country that manipulates its currency and subsidizes its manufacturers. Given our company's well-founded fear of retaliation by Chinese regulators and companies that they speak up, we in government must give voice to their concern. Let me explore that for a minute. When we have launched, typically a, a labor union in the U.S. will launch a trade uh, a, 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 a petition or a trade complaint, if you will, alleging violation by China of trade rules, often the American company where those workers work are unwilling to join that petition. Why? Because they do business in China and they know that China will exert some kind, will, 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 will in some cases have, exert some kind of revenge, exact, exact some kind of revenge against them. So our companies aren't willing to stand up to the Chinese because they know what the Chinese will do when they're doing business in China. So it's up to us as those companies' representatives, as those workers' representatives, as those community representatives to stand up. The most damaging of China's, probably the most damaging of China's violations, is its continual manipulation of its currency. By deliberately holding down the value of its currency to boost exports, China's not only violated WTO commitments, they built the largest trading surplus in history to the detriment of U.S. and other leading trading, trading partners. Senate fought back this fall by passing the Currency Exchange Rate Oversight Reform Act, legislation I authored with a bipartisan group of senators, Senator Snow from Maine, a Republican, Senator Schumer from New York, a Democrat, Senator Graham of South Carolina, a Republican, Senator Sessions of Alabama, a Demo I'm sorry, a Republican, uh, Senator Stabenow of Michigan, a Democrat, Senator Casey of Pennsylvania, a Democrat, and, and several others. This bill was the largest bipartisan bill that passed the Senate this year, passed with 63 votes, joined in fact by the junior senator from my state, Senator Portman, former trade representative in the Bush administration, um, voted for this bill. This bill would crack down on China currency manipulation, provide an opportunity for Republicans and Democrats to come together to put American jobs and American workers first. As I said, it represented the largest bipartisan jobs bill passed this session of Congress. Currency manipulation provides an unfair subsidy to Chinese exports of up to 40 percent. According to some economists, almost all economists agree it's at least 25 percent. Fred Burkston, uh, an economist, no, you know, a fairly conservative economist for the Peterson Institute, has asserted that China's intervention in currency markets and other subsidies that they've provided makes up the most, he said, most protectionist policy of any major country since World War II. American politicians 
And American CEOs are always afraid of standing up to the Chinese. They say, we'll look protectionist, or they'll say, it looks like we're starting a trade war. Well, when Fred Berkson, who is, again, a, a mainstream economist, when he said what China does is the most protectionist policy that any country's done since World War II, it's time that we stood up and forced them to play fair. That's not a trade war. In fact, the trade wars come from China. China has waged a trade war against, against the United States of America for 10 years. That's why we've seen our budget deficit uh, grow from barely double figures a decade ago with China to upwards of, of almost more than, more than a half billion dollars a day, day in, day out, seven days a week. Additionally, American manufacturers seeking to sell their products to China which is our nation's fastest growing export market, are hit with the same percentage in what amounts to an unfair tariff. So here's what happened. If a, if a company in Brunswick, Ohio, wants to sell products in China, they, um, they are hit with a 25%, maybe larger, currency tax, currency tariff. So their product costs 25% more at least. When a Chinese company wants to sell into Brunswick, Ohio, and a product in Brunswick, Ohio, competing with that company, they get a 25% bonus, a 25% advantage. Um, hardly a way to practice fair trade. A report released this fall estimates our trade deficit with China, exacerbated by China's currency manipulation, has caused the loss of 2.8 million American jobs in the past 10 years, with two-thirds of the lost jobs in the manufacturing industry. Uh, the presiding officer, when he goes to Altoona, when he goes to Bethlehem, if he'd come to Dayton or come to Toledo and see the kind of damage that this trade policy has done to American manufacturing. All of our problems in manufacturing, of course, aren't because of our relationship with China and because they've gamed the system, but, but millions of jobs in this country have had a direct, have, have, have been lost, have been undermined because of China's gaming this system. President Bush, before first President Bush said a billion dollar trade deficit or surplus is equivalent to 13,000 jobs. So when we have a greater than $200 billion persistent year in, year out trade deficit with China, that means we sell $200 billion worth of goods, of fewer goods to them than they sell to us. Just do the math. If it's 13,000 jobs per million dollar budget, billion dollar budget, deficit. You know what it's doing to us. Addressing currency manipulation through the trade remedies included in our bill with Senator Snow and Senator Casey and Schumer and, and Graham and Burr and Graham and, and, and um, Hagan and many others, that legislation would provide relief immediately to American job creators. A report released earlier this year showed that addressing currency manipulation would support the creation and retention of more than two million American jobs without requiring any government spending. That's why this is such an important jobs bill, because it's not, it's not spending any taxpayer dollars. It's just saying, level the playing field for our companies dealing with China and our workers. After years of China gaining the benefits of WTO membership without adhering to its rules, remember they promised they would go under the rule of law ten years ago this, this week, when they joined the WTO. But after years of China gaining the membership of WTO membership without adhering to its getting gaining the benefit of WTO membership without adhering to its rules, it's time Congress, time the administration act in our nation's interest. The House should pass our bill. The president should bring it up, should pass it, the president should sign it. American workers and American manufacturers can compete with anyone, but they can't compete on a playing field that's, that's far from level as long as we continue to let China do what it wants without repercussions. Over the last 10 years, Mr. President, China sidestepped and reshaped the WTO to benefit China at our expense. That's not competing, that's cheating. We must act now while we still have a chance. President, I yield the floor, uh, suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kanka.
Without objection. I ask unanimous consent pursuant to the Budget Act Control Act of 2011. The following morning business on Tuesday, December 13th, the Judicial Committee will be discharged from further consideration the following joint resolutions proposing a balanced budget constitutional amendment, and the Senate proceed to their cons consideration on block. SJ Res 10, SJ Res 24. Further, the titles of both joint resolutions be amended as follows, so they comply with the Budget Control Act. Quote, joint resolution proposing balanced budget amendment to the Constitution of the United States, end of quote. That there be up to eight hours of date on the joint resolutions to run concurrently during Tuesday session. Equal divide between leaders or the designees. That when the Senate resumes consideration of joint, resolution, joint resolutions on Wednesday, December 14th, there be up to 10 minutes of debate. Equal divide between two leaders or the res designees. Part of votes on passage of the joint resolutions. We'd vote first on SJ Res 24 and secondly on SJ Res 10. Further, there be two minutes equally divided between the votes. Finally, there be no amendments, motions, or points of order in order to either joint resolutions to the votes. Without objection. I ask that we now first read a bill that's at the desk. The clerk will read the title of the bill for the first time. H.R. 1633, an act to establish a temporary prohibition against revising any national ambient air quality standard and so forth and for other purposes. I think I may have made a grammatical error. Could we first read that? I don't think that's quite right. But anyway, you got the point. <clears throat> uh, I now ask for a second reading in order to place the bill on the counter under the provisions of Rule 14, but I object to my own request. Objection having been heard. I ask to ask consent the, the bill. Bill. I'm sorry. Bill will receive its second reading on the next legislative day. I apologize for my rudeness, Mr. President. I ask unanimous consent that when the Senate completes the business day, the Senate adjourn up till 10 a.m. tomorrow morning, December 13th, that following the prayer and the pledge, the journal proceedings will be approved to date. The morning hour be deemed expired. The, two, the time for the two leaders will be reserved for use later in the day. The following any leader remarks, the Senate be in a morning business period for two hours. The Senate is permitted to speak for up to 10 minutes each. With the time equally divided and controlled between the two leaders, Republicans are controlling the first half, majority controlling the final half. Following morning business, Senate proceed to the consideration of SJ Res 10, SJ Res 24, under the previous order. Further, the Senate recess from 12:30 until 2:15 p.m. to allow for our weekly caucus meetings. Without objection. If there's no further business, Mr. President. I ask that we adjourn under the previous order. Senate stands adjourned. Until 10 a.m. tomorrow. Today in the Senate, members approved the nomination of Norman Eisen to be the U.S. Ambassador.